Uh, we're going to be talking about developing real-time data pipelines with Apache Kafka. Uh, so quick show of hands, how many people know what Kafka is? Awesome. How many people have worked on and done development with Kafka? How many people are running Kafka in production? All right, cool, awesome. All right, uh, so my name is Joe Stein. Nice to meet everyone. I'm CEO of a company called Elodina. We're a big data as a service uh, platform company. Um, also Apache Kafka committer and PMC member. Uh, you can catch me on LinkedIn if you want to connect. Um, and uh, I, I know some folks like to have the slides during the talk, so I already tweeted my slides. So if you want to go catch those on Twitter, I can go pull the slides down and what have you. Um, all right, so today we're going to be talking about uh, a whole bunch of different stuff, right? Um, I really kind of want to drill into Kafka. Um, you know, this is not really going to be an introduction. It's going to be, you know, we're going to get a little deep, right? Maybe like 45,000, 35,000 feet or so. Uh, so we're going to do a little overview just for folks who maybe aren't familiar with Kafka. And then we're going to talk about uh, topics, partitions and segments, data durability, replication, producers and consumers, uh, talk a little about performance and, and kind of how that works. Um, a little bit about different integrations, uh, quick start, and then we're going to talk a little about operations. And that's going to basically kind of bleed into uh, a couple of designs that we're going to go through and look at what are the type of systems that you could actually build with Kafka and how does that work and what does it look like from an architectural perspective. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about distributed RPC and uh, also a reference architecture for just you know, run-of-the-mill storage and analytics, which a lot of folks are doing nowadays. All right. All right, so Apache Kafka was first open source in, uh, by LinkedIn in 2011. Um, I joined the project uh, pretty much right after it was incubated uh, to Apache uh, later on that year. Um, I'm, a, I'm a paper fan. I don't know about other folks, uh, but there's been a bunch of papers written about Kafka um, you know, from a technical perspective. Um, so if that's something that interests you, go ahead and take a look. Um, All right, so usually when folks are kind of getting into big data for the first time, right, uh, you know, maybe there's some pilot project to your organization, um, but you go and say, all right, let me get a Hadoop cluster and let me go into some front end facing service and let me get all the data and let me push it into Hadoop. And, you know, that's awesome and everyone's really excited and, you know, big wins and high fives and yay, now we've got all of our data in Hadoop and we're processing it. That's fantastic, right? And then someone comes along and says, okay, that project went so well. Right, let's go ahead and take all of the data that we have in all of our other services, and let's push that into Hadoop so we can get the same benefit, right? So now you're at a point where you've got all your data, it's going into Hadoop, you're doing your batch analytics around it, maybe you're even doing some stream processing a little bit, um, and all is well. And then someone might come along and say, oh, this is so great, you've now integrated all of our front-end services going into Hadoop, but we have this entire you know, real-time monitoring system that is already in place for our infrastructure, and we want data from all those services to go into our real-time monitoring system as well. So then you go in, and now you go and reintegrate to every single service, hook it in, move it over to the real-time monitoring system, and you know, great, all right? That project went well, and now all of a sudden other people are getting in and say, oh, wait, wait, we need that streaming data also, right? Let's take that streaming data, let's put it into the security system so we could do auditing and, and and intrusion detection. Let's get into the data warehouse so we can have you know, legacy systems be able to access it. And there are other consumer services that we want as well, right? You kind of get into this like N squared problem of you know, very difficult uh, you know, ETL uh, integration. And that's really where Kafka comes in, right? Kafka is all about decoupling data pipelines, right? It looks like a messaging system and it has messaging features, bless you, but at the end of the day, um, it's a distributed replicated log, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And if anyone has questions while we're going, um, you know, ask. If I don't have the answer immediately, I may be talking it later. So if there's something that you're interested in, like, you know, this could be interactive um, if, if you like. All right. All right. <clears throat> so, yeah, so Kafka decouples the data pipelines, right? It basically separates producers and consumers. So people who are producing data and people who are consuming data can basically go through one single source. So instead of having an N squared problem, you basically take that integration into a, a problem of one, right? Um, and it's not a messaging system, right? It is a distributed replicated log. And it's very important to understand the difference, right? And we're going to kind of talk as we go through and go about like what is Kafka and how does it work. Hopefully you'll start to kind of understand what the differences are. Right? So when you're working with distributed replicated log, right, your producers are producers can be consumers too, right? It's not just write data and then somewhere else down the line someone reads data, right? It's a very interactive process where if I'm a producer, I can be, you know, taking 
data, writing it in XML. There could be some other consumer that's taking that XML, converting it into Avro. Another consumer that's taking that Avro data, running an analysis on it. Um, and of course, obviously, at each step, there's a producer going back into Kafka, right? You can kind of have to think of this replicated log, right? So produce data into Kafka, push an XML. Some consumer reads the XML, turns it into Avro. Another consumer reads the Avro, does an analysis on it, produces it back to data, uh, back to Kafka. Another consumer takes that Avro, puts it back to the original XML with the response, and then the original producer could actually get back that data in the XML format. Right? And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about decoupling data pipelines. It's not just the interconnected systems, right? and this is very important. Right? It's not just the interconnected systems. It's also the transformations and the analysis that goes between these different data pipelines. Right? So if I can only speak you know, message format A, well, there's no reason for me to not just always be producing and consuming from Kafka under the you know, message format A structure. Other, other, other consumers and producers can handle the transformation for the downstream systems. So you don't have to worry about where to put the transformations and how do you, how do you not just connect these systems, but how do you actually get them to talk in the same format? Um, you know, very, powerful, very powerful feature. And it does this in real time, right? So you can throw as much data as you have at Kafka, and you're going to basically still be running as fast as your network, right? So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, quite performant. <clears throat> All right, so let's kind of start to dive down a little bit, right? So within Kafka, we have this concept of topics. Uh, topics is really nothing more than a logical grouping of partitions, right? And a partition is essentially, think of a partition as a log file. Um, well, really a directory of log files, uh, because that's really all it is, right? The partition is a way to organize your log files, and the topic is a kind of a virtual structure that allows you to group these log files together. And when you write to a partition, um, you're always writing and appending to the end of the log, right? So every single write appends to the end, end of the log. And Kafka guarantees ordering within a partition, so every single write that a producer has is guaranteed to actually be in sequence for when you actually wrote it on a partition by partition basis. Um, underneath partitions, there's something called log segments. Um, this is sort of kind of important to know depending on what you're trying to do, uh, especially when you're configuring the system and you may look in a directory and see 30 different log files and wondering, you know, what is that? Um, you know, ultimately, the partitions get rolled in log files and uh, those log files are something we call segments. And so you could have six or seven different log files. That is a partition. And the view of that from Kafka's perspective is from oldest to newest. And data that um, is old can get pruned off at the end um, from the log perspective, the actual like file perspective. Um, or if you're doing something like compaction in a more um, uh, ing ingenious kind of way. All right, so when I think about kind of the distributed replicated log of Kafka, this is kind of what's in my brain. Uh, so you kind of have this log in the middle, right? There's your partition. Um, everything from the partition's perspective, right? You're, it's a stream, and that stream of data is organized by what we call an offset. And an offset is really nothing more than an incrementing number, okay? Just literally just an atomic and incrementing uh, number. So as every single piece of data comes in, the next message just essentially gets the next number. In a traditional messaging system, messages will get pushed to consumers, right? And there's maybe some transaction around that. But in Kafka, that's not how it works, right? Producers push data to Kafka, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but consumers pull data. And this is really not only where we get a lot of the benefit and performance, but we also get a lot of scalability from a pure software architecture perspective. Right? You could actually have multiple consumers reading from the same place in the stream at the same or different offsets without ever having to bump into each other from a blocking perspective or any other type of um, you know, latency that's going to you know, be caused by two people trying to do the same thing um, with the same piece of information. And consumers are fetching, right? They say, I want uh, offset 3,762 and give me a megabyte above that. And Kafka just responds with the megabyte, with the offset that was the latest, and the consumer can go and fetch the next uh, piece of data. And this is kind of really just the you know, very simple pattern. Uh, producers write to partition, consumer reads from partition. All right, so over the years, there's been a lot of work, uh, say like over the last three years, there's been a lot of work put into Kafka uh, when it comes to data durability. 
So when we first released 07 back in 2011, uh, there was zero data durability, right? Um, and then we spent about a year and a half building out 08 and created a replication system. And over the last, uh, slide back there. And over the last year, uh, with 0811 and 0821, uh, we've also added some more primitives that I'll talk about in a second um, that even increases further the data durability guarantees that Kafka provides. Uh, so this really all comes from the producer's perspective. right? So when the producer is writing data to Kafka, it basically sets a, you know, what are my required acknowledgments from the brokers to make sure that this data has actually been saved. right? So you can set, uh, you know, no guarantee whatsoever, right? And your response is going to be in a microsecond or so because you don't even care whether there's a response or not. Um, you can say, hey, I want to make sure I at least got to the network and the leader at least has my data. It may not have replicated or not, but I at least want to make sure it's sort of kind of there. Um, or you can say full-blown, I want to make sure that the data is replicated on three servers and even if one of those servers is still not around for some reason, I want to guarantee that you know, it's on two of them. And that concept of what we call the minimum ISR, right? So the ISR stands for in sync replica set, right? So you have, you have these different brokers here, right? And there's a replication factor for the partitions. So you have broker one, broker two, broker three. And you could set, let's say we set a replication factor for three uh, for the partition, uh, for the topic. And then the partitions kind of, you know, flow across these three brokers. And if a broker dies, right? You can say, well, as long as two are up, I want to be able to write to them. But you want to, depending on your level of you know, data durability requirements, what if two of them died, right? Well, then you kind of get into the situation where you know, potentially for an hour, you're writing to a single rack. And if that rack dies and the other two come back up, well, you've you know, potentially just lost that entire hour's worth of data, right? Um, a lot of organizations actually have uh, required guarantees transactionally for when you write data, like it actually, that actually has to be in you know, two separate racks or three racks in a data center. Or, you know, there's different requirements that different people have. Um, so we've kind of you know, added and later into Kafka to really make these type of decisions flexible for you. So when you're producing data, you really kind of know what's happening, right? Like did this actually save? Uh, and if not, then you can go upstream and say, you know, transaction failed, the data hasn't been stored, and you can make real good intelligent decisions uh, behind that. Um, and kind of the way that it works, um, so when replication is running, brokers are actually consumers too, all right? So there's only one difference between a broker when it's replicating as a consumer and a normal consumer. Um, there's just an ID field. And if that ID is set <laughs> to a value, then it's a broker consuming. If it's negative one, then it's a consumer consuming. Pretty much everything else after that is exactly the same. Um, and some folks have a little difficulty understanding that and why. So you know, if there are any questions, like you know, throw them out there. All right, so let's go through the flow for a second. Right? So producer decides, all right, um, I want you know, full onboard data durability. Give me you know, all brokers saving all the data all the time. All right, so producer sends message into broker one, and broker one commits it to, its, um, to itself, essentially. And then what broker two and broker three are doing is they're actually consuming the data from, from, from the leader, from broker one. Right? So it's reading the data as fast as it can, taking the message off. So broker two and broker three, you know, pretty much simultaneously, are now reading that message that came in, and they're also committing uh, to, its lo to their local brokers that it has this message. And when it does that, it, each of them are incrementing their offsets. And what the leader does, right, so what broker one leader does, is it's talking to broker two and broker three, and it's saying, hey, what offset are you at? And once that broker sees that the offset has been hit, then it, it, uh, the broker takes the message out of what's called purgatory and makes it you know, alive, right? This has actually now been committed. So consumers can now see the message, right? Until, until data, even regardless of your data uh, durability requirements on the producer side, um, until the message is committed through the flow that I just went through, consumers won't see it, right? So, so Kafka makes sure that the data is replicated uh, properly and committed from the leader's perspective before any consumer could see the data. Um, and then at that time, if you set this uh, you know, all acknowledgement uh, replication, then the, the producer will also get a response, hey, you know, I've got your data. <clears throat> uh, 
so this is kind of the flow of what it looks like from uh, the data durability uh, discussion uh, uh, perspective. Uh, so any questions before I kind of drill down a little bit further uh, on the replication and kind of what this looks like? Yep. Yeah, so the question was, can I speak to the latency uh, from the replication perspective, right? Yeah, I, I will. Once I get to the performance piece, I'll, I'll make sure I add that in. And if I forget, just raise your hand again. But yeah, I'll, I'll bring that up when we get to that. Cool. All right, so let's kind of go through a very uh, naive uh, use case here, right? This is, this is just very simple just to understand concepts. All right, so again, ISR stands for the in-sync replica set. Right, the in-sync replica set is basically the replicas that the cluster thinks, uh, I mean, ultimately the controller, but like the cluster thinks that uh, they're alive, right? How far back is a broker reading in the stream, all right? And when you set up Kafka, there's like two little configs that you can set um, that will kind of tune for how far back in the stream before uh, the system says, okay, you are no longer, you're sick, you're no longer a valid uh, broker, go away, you're offline, we don't want you anymore, and uh, you know, send, send an email, page someone if you want, uh, what have you. All right, so here we have uh, A, B, and C. Uh, a is the leader. Um, uh, B and C are both uh, replica followers. All right, so message one comes in, message one gets committed to A, gets committed to B, gets committed to C. All right, so now our offset is essentially at one, all right? All right, so now, as that was happening, as I was saying that, message two and three came in. And message two got committed to A, message two got committed to B, um, but it just has not yet been committed to C yet. And message three came in and it has not been committed to B or C yet, right? So just think of this as like, you know, 10 milliseconds of a snapshot of time frozen, all right? All right, so uh, A fails, right? So some mouse went into your data center and chewed through the ethernet cord of uh, broker A and that machine has just died. All right, so now you still, there's gonna be a leader election, all right? So Kafka is basically gonna do a leader election. It's gonna say, okay, B, you are the new leader. Um, go do your thing. And when the leader election happens, the first thing that the leader does is say, ah, which offset am I at, right? And it's going to see that B, B itself, is gonna see that it's actually at offset two, right? Because it had committed that message that had come in. So it pushed in offset two. And then it's going to wait for all the other replicas now to be at offset two. Three, as the new follower for, three as the new follower for leader B, right? It's no longer pulling from A, because A is down, right? So, so C is flipped over to now pulling from B, and it's going to get message two, right? So now B pulls in message two, and it commits its offset, and B does the final commit of the offset so that everybody can see it. Uh, question? Yep, uh, so the question is, what deemed B to be the leader versus C, and then how would that essentially affect the messages, right? Yes? Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, in Kafka, there's something called uh, uh, the controller, right? And the controller is a single broker that has special powers that really kind of orchestrates and runs the internal parts of the cluster, essentially. So it's, it's purely nothing more than just leader election with Zookeeper. Right, first one wins. You know, most likely whatever machine has like you know the least traffic on it could potentially be the leader. Right, whoever's gonna you know raise its hand first and say I'm the leader. Um, in this case, if C did become the leader, its offset would be one, and message two wouldn't be saved, essentially. Right now, uh, from the from the initial producer perspective, it died because it was connected to A. Right, so that producer lost its connection, it should have. Upstream said, hey, two is not never, never saved, right? Because it's never saved to C in the first line, right? That response never act back. So even though message two is there, upstream, technically it shouldn't be, right? So you will have some data in there that upstream transactionally may never had said that it could have been saved. So it's not so much about losing data as it is, you just may have a little bit extra data to that, you know, uh, upstream potentially said that it, you know, it wasn't there. Yep. So, so 
Yes, the question is, uh, so the act does not occur until uh, all of the replication is complete. That was the question and the answer is yes, right? And it's the leader who sees that all of the replicas have actually hit the right offset at that time. And then only then does the leader go and respond, if it can, obviously. Yep. Right, no act is gonna occur for M2 because it crashed while it was writing M2, right? And it never got that act back initially, even though M2 is saved there. And in different scenarios, like maybe you want that, right? Maybe you actually just want you know, true availability and making sure that like, no matter what, you're capturing all the data that you want to capture. And it's not a transactional situation, right? Different use cases, and, each, and this is at a topic level. So you could have some topics that are extremely durable, right? And you could have some topics that are like, whatever, you know? It's like just you know, metrics, so it's fine. All right, so. But, but M3 is gone. M3 is gone, M3 is gone right? Yeah, and with M3 being gone, I don't like to say that it's lost because technically it was never, it was never deemed guaranteed saved, right? It would be lost if it had upstream said, hey, I had this, right? And then it didn't. But there was no response ever that M3 ever made it anywhere to anyone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Same thing with M2. Yeah, produced when have the acknowledgement, so no one should have the expectation that that data was ever there. So it's not that it's lost, it's more that it just wasn't saved. Yep. So we're saying then it's like for M2, there was never an act that came back to the, the producer. So from the producer's perspective, M2 failed, but it's actually there. So if it tried to retry, you would have two equivalent of what's in M2. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so the question is, so if the producer got that failure, it's going to want to retry, and then when it writes it again, M2, there would actually be a duplicate. Yes, there would be a duplicate. Yep. <laughs> Downstream. We can talk about that too. Maybe after, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so, okay. So, three. Um, so, now message four and five come in. Woohoo. One sec. All one partition, right? Oh, yes. We're still all on a single partition. Yep. Yep, yep. All right. So, now M4 and M5 fly in. And uh, you know that gets written to C, and everything's good to go. And now A comes back online, right? Someone checked their pager, they put the broker on, they plugged in a new cord, whatever. A comes back online. Uh, the first thing the, the broker is going to do is it's going to say, all right, which offset was I actually at officially, and truncate everything below it. So now at this point, M3 doesn't even exist any longer on A, right? It's just going to it's just going to truncate it completely. Um, but then it's going to say, oh wait, I need to get back into this replica set. Let me be a follower of B. So now A is going to be a follower of B and catch four and five up. And when it does that, it can now be joined back into the ISR, essentially. And depending on what version of Kafka you're using, if you're using 0811, then at this time you'd have to actually run like a preferred leader election to move B back to A. Or if you're using 0821 and you have it turned on, uh, that flip back from follower to leader would automatically go right back to A. All right, so let's talk a little bit about producers. Um, so producers are uh, very lightweight uh, uh, applications when it comes to its interaction with Kafka. Um, the first thing a producer does when it talks to Kafka is it does what's called a metadata request, and it says, give me the topology, all right? So this is actually very beneficial because you don't have to worry about like service discovery or which leader should I write to or how all these like internals should be working. All of that's kind of done for you. Um, in the producer client libraries, and we'll talk about that a little bit, and it should be. Um, and at the wire protocol perspective, which we'll get into a little bit as well, um, you kind of get this entire layout of who are the leaders for which partitions, so when you write to them, um, you could actually go ahead and write to them you know, intelligently. And when you create, let's say you create a topic with three partitions, what Kafka is gonna do is basically fundamentally load balance, right? spread the load of the partitions across the brokers. So if you have three partitions uh, with replication three, then you're basically going to have every single broker be a leader for at least one of the partitions. So whenever the producer is writing to partition zero, it's going to write to one. And whenever it's one, it's going to write to two. Whenever it's three, it's going to write to three. Right? Obviously a very naive uh, example, but if you can imagine tens of thousands of producers writing, you don't want them all just writing to one broker, right? Uh, obviously. 
All right, so on the consumer side, uh, consumer side gets a little bit trickier. Uh, so there's kind of two different types of consumers. Um, so you, one type of consumer is where you're really low level working intimately with the wire protocol and the uh, offsets and the coordination of the other consumers that are running. And then the second is kind of what we call the high level consumer, which does a lot of the uh, 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 orchestration for you. Yep. Yeah, so the question was, if the producer is writing to more than one broker, is, the, is he always writing to the leader? Uh, the answer is yes, and same from the consumer. Everything in Kafka is about the leader. The only follower need is purely based on the brokers doing that. Producers and consumers, it's all about the leaders. Yep. Now, the leader could be different for each partition, right? It's, yeah. Yep. That's how it spreads the load. Yeah, that's how it spreads the load, right. The leader could be different for each partition, correct. All right, so in the high-level consumer example, um, and a lot of folks have built consumers, uh, they're awesome to build, and you should kind of build it this way. You kind of create what's called a consumer group, and a consumer group is a way to organize different consumers to either work together or to be separate. So you may have three consumers that really need to interact with this data and do high computations really fast, so you need three of them and you want that to read off of you know, stream topic A. Uh, but now you also want, let's say, consumer group B, maybe it's just taking the data and backing it up to S3. So no big deal, almost no computation. Who cares if it's a little slow, right? Just as an example. Um, so you only need one of those, right? And now you could have these two different groups together reading from the stream at a different time, right? So you could have multiple consumers, which could actually be processes, reading from uh, coordinated, you know, from the stream, right? So A1 is going to read from partition 0, A2 is going to read from partition 1, and A3 is going to read from partition 2. And this is really where partition comes in and the, you know, parallelization of the processing uh, for that data, All right? All right, so now let's say A3 goes down. Uh, well, what the consumers will do is basically a rebalance and kind of orchestrate themselves together and say, hey, you know, oh my goodness, you know, B is down. What are we going to do? Um, so A2 can basically start reading from, uh, you know, uh, partition 2 because it knows uh, A3 is down. And depending on which client library you use, because there's a lot out there, you know, some client libraries will do a complete rebalance, meaning if you're pushing in a million messages per second and you have, let's say, 4,000 partitions and one partition goes down, some client libraries will actually stop all traffic and do a full rebalance, and when it's done, it'll allow the traffic in again. So, you know, these are things that you kind of want to look at and how client, some client libraries work, right? Some client libraries won't do that. There's a communication layer that'll actually allow them to say, oh, all right, you know, partition 78 is down, no big deal, give that to consumer 35. And then everyone can still kind of read and stream their data and just the failed partition can kind of go and flip over, right? Um, and this is all kind of depending on, you know, who and how the library has been uh, developed. All right, uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, producer performance, and I will also roll that into the broker performance too. Yep, questions? So the key is like, why, why would it matter? Why would what matter? The, the client, the ah, so the question is, why would it matter if the consumer goes down? So each consumer in a consumer group is reading from a different partition than any other consumer in that group, right? If I'm reading from partition zero, and you're reading from partition one, and he's reading from partition two, and he goes away, now nobody's reading from partition two. So you and I have to be like, well, wait, I'll, you know, I, I'll get partition two. I'll read from that, right? You need to have someone reading from the partition, otherwise it just doesn't get processed, right? You've got data coming in that doesn't get processed. And that's why it's important to make sure that somebody's picking up that partition and reading from it, right? Yep. Uh, yep. Yeah, so the simple consumer doesn't have any concept of rebalancing or anything like that, right? That's the kind of thing you have to manage yourself. And there's so many libraries and implementations that are out there. You, you know, it's, um, it's become a large ecosystem and a little bit, you know, difficult to navigate. 
Um, but it, it is an important thing to understand what, you know, what different, you know, the Kafka spout and storm was completely different than the high level consumer does, which is completely different than how Spark works, right? All these different things, different than how Spring is gonna work, even though Spring used the high level consumer, right? They have all these different pieces of the ecosystem. It's, it's, it's really important to understand what they're doing and what your expectation is, right? All right, any other, any other questions on how consumers? Yeah so, yeah, so the question is, what if you add more consumers to the consumer group? So in this case, let's say you added A4, nothing would happen, because there's no partitions for it to read from. You can only have, within a consumer group, um, a partition being read by one and only one consumer. So here, if we added A4 in, it would be idle. However, if A3 died, A4 would potentially pick up the load and not have to double the load up on A2. Right? So I have definitely seen some people spin up you know, twice as many consumers so that you know, if they die, you've got to have them running already. There's no you know, ramp up time, but there would still be a rebalance, right? Yeah. Yeah, yes. So the question is, if we had four partitions and A was reading from two and three, and we added four, would it rebalance, and then each would have one, yes. For the high-level consumer out of the project, yeah. <laughs> Again, client library specific, which we'll get into a little bit. All right, so let's talk about uh, performance a little bit. Uh, so Jay wrote a great blog about you know two million writes per second with Kafka uh, on some real commodity hardware. Um, this is all the new producer that came out. I don't know. It feels like a year ago now, maybe at this point. Uh, it's a complete rewrite of the producer uh, for a number of different reasons. Um, and basically, you get some you know, pretty amazing performance. Uh, so this end-to-end -end latency number, um, this is basically the waiting for acknowledgment. So the question before about like, what's the latency from a replication perspective, right? you're looking at about two milliseconds from data going into Kafka and two other brokers capturing it and all the communication and responses and everything else before it actually commits and people can see it. And at the same time, the producer actually gets the acknowledgement back, right? And we're talking about you know, lots of data going in, right? This is not just one request at you know, two milliseconds, right? This is two million uh, writes. And I, and I forget, like, I think the 99.9% .9 latency, there was like a 14 millisecond outlier. Um, and I also think that there was some patches in the broker that uh, uh, fixed that as well, but we'll see when 09 comes out. Uh, on the, oh, oh, sorry, one more thing with the producer. Uh, so if you read the original paper of Kafka from like years and years and years ago, you'll actually see the producer patter, uh, pittering out at about like 65, 70% of network uh, NIC saturation. Um, with the new producer, you, you actually can saturate a NIC. Um, so your, your producing requests are you know, more or less like network bound. And we'll talk a little bit in a second about why and how that is. All right, so let's talk about uh, the consumer and how that works, and then a little bit more about the efficiencies that Kafka has built into it. All right, so when you're reading from Kafka, uh, if you look at this chart, it basically says uh, it goes, you're, you're basically pulling data uh, as fast as your network can go, right? No matter how much data you're pulling out of Kafka, you're going to be bound by your network, essentially. Um, and the way that this happens is that when you look at, if you look at, if you kind of conceptualize the architecture for a second, right? Um, a producer is sending data into Kafka. And when it does that, right, uh, the operating system page cache, uh, everyone's familiar with the page cache or not, what the operating system page cache does is that it takes any available memory that it has and takes all the most recent writes and sticks them in memory. Right? Thanks, operating system. Good job. All right. Now, what Kafka does is it uses something called um, uh, Java NIO's file channel. There's a function called transfer2. And what that does is it basically does a kernel copy, right? So I think you, uh, if you're really interested in this stuff, click the link. IBM wrote a whole big article about file channel and, and context switching and all of that. So you know, just go read it if you're interested. Um, this is high level. Uh, so what it does is it skips a bunch of context switches in user space, moving the data in and out of kernel space into user space and all those context switches. And it keeps it all in, it keeps it all in kernel space. And since the data is in memory, right? Back to the cage, page cache, right? The operating system page cache has that data in memory. Since that data is memory, it basically, within the kernel space, goes straight from memory right to socket, okay? And that's how we're able to achieve, basically, 
you know, network level performance, right, kind of secret magic open source sauce there to you know, be able to stream this data. So if you have, and, and it's relative, right? <clears throat> Obviously, if you read from three hours ago, if you don't have enough memory to hold that broker's data in memory, you're gonna go hit disk, right? Because now it's no longer in memory. Even if it's a kernel copy, you're gonna go hit disk. And I've seen lots of ops folks kind of say, oh my goodness, why is this happening? It's like, oh, we just ran an analytics job. You know, looking at our data from a while ago, of course you're gonna increase the IOPS in, on, your, you know, on, your, on your machine. And you know, sometimes folks separate clusters to work around that, and you know, we could talk about that offline and how all that works. But, um, so there's been a bunch written up on, the, on maximizing efficiency. And I don't think I had said this before, but the Kafka documentation is uh, immensely detailed and very well thought through and uh, a good read. So I definitely say like, good first place to start is just go to kafka.apache.org, read the documentation. So this is just kind of one of like 10 sections or whatever, like some subsection within 10 sections um, about like where the maximizing efficiency comes in, essentially. All right, uh, any other questions on performance? All right. All right, so client libraries. Um, so uh, I guess first before I talk about client libraries, let's talk about the wire protocol real quick. Um, so when Kafka communicates either between brokers or producers and consumers, um, it does it over TCP IP and it uses our own custom byte structure, right? So we're talking about byte buffer structures going back and forth over the wire. And we decided a long time ago to not use Thrift or protocol buffers or any other serialization, deserialization libraries. We kind of leave that up to the higher level client so that we can be very specific around what we're trying to do without any additional overhead or inclusion of any other uh, software applications, right? So all of this is really completely out of the box Kafka talking to itself. And the reason I bring that up is because it's a really great place to start to read and understand how and what Kafka does. Because if it doesn't go through the wire protocol, then it's a, in a, an API level function. And if it does go through the wire protocol, you could actually read the wire protocol and understand what all the you know, back and forths are actually happening. The metadata requests, what data is in there, how does the structure look? So it's not just for folks who are trying to build client libraries. I actually encourage people to you know, really, excuse me, read the, client, uh, read the wire protocol to kind of get a good sense around um, what's going on. Now, after that, Go ahead and jump into a client library, right? Find a, you know, a language that you use, um, go check out the client libraries and give it a shot. You know, definitely understand what that client library does and doesn't do because the expectations after the wire protocol, you know, right now there's not a lot of control around that. Um, you know, uh, Cloudera and Confluent had announced a while ago to start to create some more conformity um, around you know, testing and you know, I, I think over the next six months you know, we'll see a little bit more of a, you know, uh, an understanding of what client libraries do do and don't do so that there's not some crazy expectation that you go download some you know, client library and it doesn't do what the Kafka project says it should do, right? So it's, 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 it's something you really have to you know, look into a little bit. Um, and then there's one for Spring. Uh, so there's a blog post about it, some source code, some XD samples. Uh, I'm sure if you have uh, Kafka Spring questions, uh, Marius is here, I'd definitely hook, you know, uh, talk to him. All right, uh, quick start. Uh, so getting up and running with Kafka is really simple. Pop open four terminal windows, click this link, go ahead and take these commands and put them in each terminal window. And you know, three seconds later after you download it, you're basically gonna have a Kafka broker running with Zookeeper and producing and consuming data from it you know, very simply. So anything you type into the producer console, Right, so there's a console producer that comes out of the box, so you can just, you know, just type data into your terminal and it'll just get pushed into Kafka, and then a console a consumer that'll just read that data off of Kafka and show it in the terminal, right? So very simple kind of, you know, how do I get this running, um, you know, first step uh, and what have you. All right, <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about uh, operationalizing Kafka and what's involved there. Uh, any other questions, because kind of, you know, as, as the talk's moving into different uh, segments, if there's any other questions, so something that I've brought up or saved for the end is fine too. Yep. Where can you back for the uh, 083 You're like six slides ahead of me, man. <laughs> I won't even repeat the question. <laughs> yeah, he asked about the 083 client. All right, so we'll, we'll get there. We'll talk a little bit about that. All right. Um, 
All right, so operationalizing Kafka. Uh, so yeah, there is definitely a lot of things that you need to do uh, when it comes to uh, running and managing uh, uh, Kafka brokers. And this really comes down to um, managing topics and partitions and where they're sitting and where they're living, um, you know, mirroring data between your clusters. What happens if now all of a sudden you have more data coming in? You, know, you, have, to add more top, you have to add more partitions so that you can handle the load or better parallelize that data coming in downstream. Um, what if you want to change the replication factor, right? Originally you thought that two was a good replication factor and uh, maybe, maybe for some topic that changed, right? So you need to have kind of a dynamic way to interact with the cluster and do things as it's operating and running, right? And it's kind of an obvious uh, thing, but uh, so a lot, of, a lot of work's been put into Kafka to you know, allow for tooling. Um, you know, over the years uh, and currently we're still trying to layer in uh, more tools on top of the tools that exist now. Um, when folks kind of go in and you know, work with these tools over and over again, you kind of create more layers of code that we want to share in common. So there's been some work done to you know, take the admin tools and actually make them accessible through uh, the wire protocol. Right? So instead of you know, interacting with the tool API, uh, sorry, the tool, the tool CLI, uh, you could actually just talk to Kafka over the wire protocol to you know, interact with your topics and, and make changes and stuff. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about running on Mesos quick, um, because even if you're not going to do this in production, from a uh, uh, application development and testing perspective, there's really no better way to run Kafka and producers and consumers right now than on Mesos. And a lot of that comes from um, automating a lot of the experience that people have had running Kafka, along with um, uh, automating all of the uh, operational tasks as well. And I'll give some examples in a little bit. Um, so just in case, this is going to be real fast, just in case people have no clue what Mesos is. Uh, so Mesos is an open source project that came out a couple years ago. Um, it runs a whole bunch of production systems that you would all be familiar with at this point. Um, and it really is, you know, if you're not using Mesos, then you're more or less doing static partitioning. Even if you're running some, you know, virtual environment, at the end of the day, you're still statically partitioning those machines. Even if those machines are elastic, <laughs> the, the machine is still, you know, holding... 16 CPU and 64 gigs of RAM or whatever it is. So you know, some human being goes in and what they do is they'll deploy you know, their web servers, let's say that's the red, you know, they'll deploy the, red server, the web servers to red and you know, the database servers to green and you know, they use Puppet or Chef or what have you and now all of a sudden you've got more load coming in, oh my goodness we need more web servers but we don't have more machines, what do we do? So now they go and you install the web servers on the database servers and the ops people start freaking out like oh my god we should use containers, what are you doing? And then just as that's happening, the rack crashes, and now like, oh my goodness, what do we do? Like, where do we take all that load? And now you've got like, you know, 10 ops people look at each other screaming, and it's all crazy, right? Uh -huh. and, and besides the, you know, craziness of having to deal with that, you're ultimately wasting resources, right? Data centers are somewhere between like, uh, you know, five and 60% uh, of just complete and total utilization, right? So if you're at the 10%, 5% utilization, that means you're, wasting 95, 90% of your resources, right? And that's the difference that just straight up, that's the difference between like stati static, uh, static partitioning and, and, and elasticity. And we're not talking about VMs, we're talking about CPU, RAM, disk, network, right? Fine-grained resources. And that's where, Mes that's where Mesos comes in, right? So Mesos is basically a operating system for your data center. It takes all the computers that you have and presents it as one big supercomputer, essentially. You know, the word super is in quotes, it depends on how much uh, CPU and RAM you have, but you know I know for a fact one of the top 200 supercomputers in the world is actually a Mesos cluster, um, which is kind of cool. So uh, yeah, so you don't have to worry about where the application is running. You don't have to worry about all of the other things that humans worry about today. Like the computer does that for you. And you know as software engineers and, and IT folks, like we're all here to get you know computers to you know enhance what we're trying to optimize. And there's no reason that shouldn't happen in the data center. Right. And I'm, I'm a big proponent of obviously Mesos seeing like all the things, right? Everything should go on Mesos, uh, you know, even Cloud Foundry, like everything should just run on Mesos. Um, so yeah, all right, so let's talk about Kafka on Mesos and why am I even talking about this. Uh, so when you're, running, when you're running Kafka, right, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you need to do. First, you need to assign broker IDs, right? I wanna launch six brokers, right? Well, they each need to have different IDs. And that sounds simple, Right? But if you're running in an environment where maybe you're doing things like auto-scaling, well, when a machine comes down and the machine comes back in, how does it know what 
ID to assign uh, the broker, right? If you have six brokers and broker three fails and, and the machine comes back in, how does it know to actually go ahead and assign it to broker three? Right, now, not huge you know, computer science problem, but still work that you have to do and work that everybody has to do to make that type of thing work. Um, how about if you have a broker fail and you want to make sure that it actually goes and you know, goes back to where the data is, right? Sometimes you don't want failures to actually spin up other machines. You want to wait to see what happened, right? So if a machine rebooted, let's say, let's say you're not in the cloud and you actually have real servers and the machine just restarted, right? You don't want some system to just go say, oh, let me start another broker somewhere. Because if you have 20 terabytes of data sitting, it's going to take a long time to replicate over your network. No matter how fast your network is going to be, it's going to be 20 terabytes of data over your network, and it's going to take time. Right? So you want to have some intelligence behind these scaling optimizations. You want to do it in a way that it knows how Kafka works. Right? Uh, you also want to do configuration changes. Right? Everything in Kafka is configurable. I mean, there's so many bells and whistles and buttons and levers that you can really do anything, and it's all based on property files. And when you manage that, right, now you gotta get Chef and Puppet, and now you gotta get it all to work together, and then you gotta get rolling restarts to working, and like, oh my god, how does that work, right? So there's a lot of effort that goes into that. Um, uh, scaling clusters up and down, right? Like, how do I add more brokers? You know, how do, I, how do I even create a topic and have the partitions go on different racks or different AZs, right? So like, when you create those partitions, you wanna make sure that the, the brokers that they're on, they're not all on the same rack. Right? If you have 20 brokers and you know, four racks, five per rack, and you create you know, a topic with replication three, you don't want all three, you, know, you don't want <laughs> all the partitions to be on rack one, right? So, so yeah, good. Yeah, so the question is, yeah, so the question is how distributed is this? Uh, so the answer is it's as distributed as you have um, uh, uh, the ability to distribute Zookeeper, right? So <laughs> long story short, really it's a per data center type of a cluster, right? You don't, it's, it's not for the faint of heart to go ahead and, you know, make Zookeeper run uh, worldwide. And if that's something that you want to do and you're interested in, then like totally Google Camille Fournier's post on uh, you know, doing multi-DC distributed Zookeeper. Right? It's really kind of the you know, best place to start with that type of stuff. Um, however, uh, Kafka has lots of tools that have been built to make it so that you could have a Kafka cluster running in one data center, and then there's a couple of different uh, mirror makers out there. We call them mirror makers. Um, uh, it was one in the Apache project. Uh, our company built one. Um, and basically what they do is they just mirror and replicate the data from one cluster to another. So yeah, so you can have the geographic boundaries uh, with multiple clusters. The one thing that you wouldn't get would be that data durability guarantee that it actually wrote it to another place. If you wanna do something like that, then you, know, you should use Cassandra, and you should have the consumer do some ping back to the producer, which we'll talk about a little bit in the designs. Uh, you could have the consumers actually ping back to the producer that it was written to Cassandra. So you can do a multi-DC quorum write in Cassandra, and then the consumer can tell the producer that that happened. So you can't actually achieve a global distribution from your Kafka data, but there's some more software engineering that you kind of have to you know, get in there. I mean, it's like straight up, like pull the goggles down, you know, light the blowtorch, but you, it can be done. And people do it, and it works great. All right. Uh, and then, like I said, smart, smart partition assignment, right? Like, where are these partitions actually being created? Uh, it's an, and it's an open source project, so if you want to go check it out, it's github.com slash mesa slash Kafka. Uh, so what the scheduler does is basically everything that, that I just said and more, right? The scheduler is one intelligent piece of software running on the cluster that's watching everything that's happening with the brokers and understanding what should happen next. So you have one single piece of code that's actually automating everything. What are the broker IDs? Uh, you know, which brokers are going where, which partitions are going where, right? You actually have software that's making the decisions instead of having to open up a Jira ticket and have a DevOps person go and use Puppet and do all this other crazy stuff, right? Like, all of that is completely automated nowadays, um, if, if, you want it, if you want to use it, of course. Um, uh, and there's a REST API and CLI, which I'll talk about real quick. Uh, so everything we do uh, from the REST API perspective, we also make available in the CLI and vice versa so that either a human or an, or an application can work on this. 
so you can pretty much add, update, remove brokers. You can create topics. You can start brokers. You can stop brokers. You could rebalance uh, the partitions within the cluster. I mean, pretty much anything that you could think of um, that you can do with Kafka, you could basically do through the REST API programmatically in an automated way or from a command line as an operator, essentially, right? Uh, I mean, everything, right? Topic creation, updates and configs, rolling restarts, uh, the whole nine yards. Uh, and it's really simple, like you could launch 20 brokers in seconds. Um, so you can go into the Vagrant folder of the project and Vagrant up and run this and then boom, you've got 20 brokers running uh, in, in a couple seconds. All right, so let's talk about zero nine. Any questions about any of that or? Cool. All right, so 083 is not coming out, all right? It was decided that 083 will be renamed 09. So it's coming out, but just under you know, the more recent name, which makes a lot of sense because there's actually a lot of features. There's like, I look, there's like 300 something resolve tickets, and there's still 23 blockers open on 09. So there's, like, there's a whole lot that's been done um, on trunk since the 0821 release. Um, and then there's a still a whole bunch of other stuff. But the two things that I really wanted to call out more than anything else. Uh, was the new consumer and the security um, uh, changes as well. Uh, so first, quick on the new consumer. Uh, so the new consumer has been, the consumer has been completely rewritten, right? So just like the producer was rewritten, uh, the consumer has now been rewritten as well. Um, and the, the consumer had a much larger rewrite than the producer. So on the producer side, when you went from old producer to new producer, you basically went from uh, a keyed message to producer record and then just bound to a new library, and maybe one other change, and that was it, right? Real simple plug and play. You got rid of the Scala dependency, and everything was a Java dependency, and you know, really easy, kind of good to go. The new consumer wasn't just written in Java, it is completely redesigned, right? From the ground up, taking every single issue that people have had, how do I manage my own offset? You know, all of the things that people have been trying to do with Kafka from the consumer perspective, and either, you know, maybe not doing the best job that could have been done and still putting it out there, um, or just not being able to, to work with it at the fine-grained way and said, no, I just have to go right to the wire protocol and just build everything from the ground up completely how I want it. Um, and what the new consumer is really geared towards doing is not having, not, people not having to work with the wire protocol if they don't need to, right? But still give them enough power to be able to run and build all the features that they need to build um, with a really good API. So, if you're interested in this kind of stuff or you're a user of Kafka, definitely go check out the consumer redesign um, and understand it. You can go play with it off of Trunk. Uh, there's still some more work that needs to be done. Uh, there's no more dependency on Zookeeper uh, from the consumer's perspective. Um, we are handling that now on the broker side, the same way that Kafka has a controller for the brokers where the controller is deciding what's happening with the different brokers. There's now also a coordinator. Right? So the coordinator is actually handling the partition assignment and the rebalancing and all of these other intermediaries. Um, there's quite, quite a bit in there uh, to, to take a look at. Um, the second is security. Yep, good. Zero nine. Yeah, it, the, the new consumer will only work in zero nine. Um, yep. Yeah, so the question is, how about the old consumer API? Will that be deprecated and supported? Um, yeah, so the idea is to deprecate that, right? Um, whether it continues to be supported, I don't think that will happen with inside the Apache project. Um, but if enough folks are still using it, it's not too hard to, to work on that. Really, the issue comes is that you know, we decided I, it, uh, nine months ago or so to not put anything in the old consumers unless it was like super critically broken, right? And we did that because there's so much functionality in the new consumer except for the, you know, how do I, how do I you know, take my code and get it to work with the new stuff? Besides that, right, <laughs> which obviously is a lot for people, I get it. Um, it, it really is the path that we want people to be on. You know, that high-level consumer is old, <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 Yeah
Oh, yeah, the simple consumer. Um, yeah, so I think on the simple consumer side, it, the, you're, the, it's, it's the same story, honestly. It's still the same story. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, yeah? Um, so the question is, how smooth would 0.8 to 0.9 be? And then is that from brokers or all the other? Okay, whole ecosystem. Yeah. So the uh, so when we when we developed 08, we specifically made that the last breaking change we really ever wanted to do, um, and we actually created something called the Kafka improvement uh, process. I, I actually glossed over, so thanks for reminding me. <laughs> I'm answering your question, I promise. Um, and with the Kafka improvement processes, if anyone's like familiar with like PIP or whatever, it's kind of modeled after the same thing. We call them KIPs. Um, and what it basically is is a way for either uh, uh, contributors and committers of the project or even people outside the project to really document and explain what is happening with these changes. So if there are things like a breaking change, you understand like what to do with it. And everyone else also understands if we even want to allow something like that to begin with, right? These Kafka improvement processes, these are proposals, right? And, and we've been very uh, 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 strict and focused to have as few if no breaking changes ever um, when it comes to this stuff. So the 0809 upgrade, you know, at this point should really be in place, right? You should stop a broker, start the broker, and it starts up essentially, right? And even if the wire protocol changes, like the wire protocol is versioned. So you can still have, you know, different parts of the systems talking at different versions at different times. Once all those brokers are, are once all those new brokers are up, then now you can go ahead and roll out your, you know, new consumers and everything else. So it really should just be a, you know, in place upgrade, stop, start, run it, um, and kind of good to go. And that may not, honestly, just because, you know, we need to be honest with ourselves here, that may not happen to 0 0.9.0 0.1, right? That could be what happens in the you know, patch release after you know, a lot of different people try to upgrade and hit different scenarios. But you know, the LinkedIn team and the Confluent team and a lot of other folks who you know, run Kafka off of trunk, you know, they, they go through all this, obviously, right? So hopefully as much can be catched as possible. Um, but yeah, you want to test it out too, right, in your own environments. But yeah, it should be, it should be in place quick. No headaches. All right, so uh, security, yeah. Uh, so Kafka has never had any security whatsoever in any way, shape, or form, not even close. And anyone who's ever used Kafka knows that uh, if you're talking to the network people and you're trying to put credit card data in, you're gonna you know, have potentially some issues. So uh, what we did is we looked at the entire like pie in the sky, how would security in Kafka look years from now, and we kind of coordinated and talked about all the different pieces of what we wanted in there. Uh, and now, uh, on Trunk, you have SSL, SASL authorization, right? Kerberos, like you can actually do some pretty cool things now with Kafka from a security perspective. Uh, producers and brokers and brokers and brokers and consumers and brokers, not only can they be encrypted, um, they can be authenticated and authorized and you can have it run in the same Kerberos environment that you have with everything else, right? The, the story around security from a Kafka perspective um, has really, uh, I mean, it, it, it's not even that it is, it, I can't say that it got better because it didn't exist, right? <laughs> it's not like the story was bad, it just didn't have one, right? But now the story is actually a good story out of the gate. And I think for anyone who's worked with the Kafka uh, community, um, one thing is that, yeah, it may take a little bit of time for releases to get out, but it's really well thought through and the code is really well you know, written and, and worked on uh, you know, diligently. Um, so, uh, and, and a lot of folks have contributed to this, right? This is a combined effort between like five or six different organizations. Uh, you know, Hortonworks, Cloudera, like everyone's kind of gotten together to figure out like how do we make Kafka work the same way that our Hadoop Kerberos works, right? And how do we test it out to make sure that that never breaks? Um, so, uh, you know, all of that work came from uh, you know, that, that effort, essentially. And there's more, right? There's always more to be done. Um, and it's an open source project, so if people are interested in, you know, contributing, like, you know, awesome. Uh, always looking for more folks. Uh, and then there's Jira, right? So, like, everything's in Jira, just like everyone else. Um, and if you're interested to see where we are with the 09 release, you know, it's really hard to say. Like, everyone's like, oh, when is it going to get it released? 
all right, when you click on that JIRA link and there are no blockers, that's when it's gonna get released. You know, and unfortunately, that's the best answer that I could honestly give. If you want me to like look at my crystal ball or like shake my magic eight ball and like look up and see who's like, when is it gonna get it released? I, I don't know. You know like, <laughs> maybe sometime in October, right? Maybe another three, four weeks to knock out some of the last consumer issues that are there or some of the other changes that maybe need to go in. Um, but you know, it's, it's hard. It's like herding cats sometimes in an open source project. Um, but things are moving along, right? There's a good pace that's now coming out. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm excited soon to, and you can run it off of Trunk if you want. Like if you really need security off of Kafka, go pull Trunk and start using it. Um, yeah, anything else on Kafka 09? Anything else? Yep. Was there a 1.0? Huh? Is there ever going to be a 1.0? Yeah, so we talked about 1.0 a long time ago, and you know, what are all the different things that need to be in there? So you can go and like, search the mailing lists and look in that kind of stuff. Um, you know, we kind of, when we, when we originally planned 0 0.9, it was really all around, you know, the new consumer. And now that that's there is kind of why we changed the name from 0.83 to 0 0.9. And then, and when I say we, like, this is a community discussion, right? It's an open source project. Like, no single person makes the decision. It's complete meritocracy, right? It's an Apache project. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, whether 0 0.10 comes out before 1.0, maybe. Right, like definitely could see a 0.10 release coming out for a 1.0 release because there's still so much other things that you want to you know have within the stack. Um, if people have been following uh, the kips and any of the discussions, um, if you haven't, make sure you're sitting down. Like Kafka is going to get really crazy soon because there's going to be so many features that you used to have in other systems that are actually now going to be built into Kafka. Right, so uh, to call out three, and this is not in 0.9, so this is like post 0.9. Right, so one is a system called Copycat, and there's another one that's a processing system, and then a third that's like a transformation system. And basically, that's gonna allow you to do uh, a couple things. So one, you're basically gonna be able to take a Kafka broker and then have what's called a connector. And the, the connector is going to allow you to implement whatever connectors are available. So let's say there's a JDBC connector for Kafka then you basically take the JDBC connector from Kafka and it will just automatically start pushing data into the Kafka broker from your database, right? And then same on the other side, source and sync, right? So on the, on the source side, um, anything that's in the Kafka broker, you could just have automatically written to S3 if there's a connector. And prior to this kind of connector paradigm, there's just a lot of work in the producers and consumers that people had to write over and over and over the exact same code. Um, so if you're really interested in that, I think Neha is giving a talk at Strata in like a week or two about it. Uh, definitely try to attend that or watch it or whatever, or just go on the mailing list and read about Copycat and some of the other uh, features that are in there. Um, also transformations and processors. So I mean, it's going to get streaming, right? You're basically be able to do joins. You're going to be able to do transformations, right? You kind of think of like, what if you know the what if, what if someone sat down and said like. What would it look like if we took SAMHSA and pushed it into Kafka, right? Uh, so you can go follow all those threads in the mailing list, right? This is all public information, so um, hopefully it's not too shocking to folks. And, and personally, I think it's really exciting, right? To basically be able to get kind of Kafka out of the box running, and then all of a sudden it's just reading and writing from the different systems that I need to with like zero development, fantastic, high five, like more of that. <clears throat> all right, any, any other questions about that? Kind of want to talk a little about because we got about know, 20 minutes or so. Um, kind of want to talk a little bit more about different designs of kind of how an architecture would look like if you're trying to use Kafka and, and, and what have you. Yep. Uh, the question was, am I going to elaborate about the persistence of Kafka? Um, in what way? That I haven't already done, sorry. <laughs> like what, what, other, what other information? Um, no, but if you have a specific question after the architectural patterns, just bring it up again, and then we can talk about it. If that's not enough, ask me after or something. Okay, but yeah, not going to get into that. We're totally now on pure architecture. What you do once you've gotten through all the other slides, right? And kind of now we're looking at this from a system perspective. All right. So a lot of people have been trying to do distributed RPC for a while, right? I think when Storm came out, everyone got really excited. It's like, oh, we can do distributed RPC, and everyone tried it. It was like, Ugh. you know, like maybe not. So uh, it's completely possible, though, to build a distributed RPC system uh, with Kafka. Um, we built a couple of them in different languages and different systems, and it's, uh, it's, it's not entirely challenging to, to do it and kind of just talk through 
Uh, one, why you would want to do something like that, and two, um, you know, what are the pieces that would actually make this work? Um, so first, the reason you would want to do something like this, right? Why would I want to push data into Kafka, and then after that data has been pushed in, take that response and send it to someone else, right? Kafka's not a queue. Uh, at least that's what some people say, and they think that. And uh, so yeah, so what happens is like, let's say you have a situation where um, you have a, an email and you're processing emails, or you're processing instant messages, or you know, whatever it is. You're processing some data, and you want to do like a compliance check on it, right? You actually want to see if this data is valid. And then let's say you also want to do a security check, and then you also want to have it go through your machine learning algorithm to decide you know, whether or not you want to you know, tell that user who is clicking something that they should buy more of something else, whatever it is, right? You have these kind of lots of different things that you want to happen along the data pipeline, Right? And then once all of those different things have done, right, you actually then want to have a, a response geared to, war, to what that original request was for. And that's what we're talking about here. Right? So you know, let's say a message comes in uh, to the producer, so one. Uh, producer writes that to the Kafka cluster. And then you have a consumer that reads that from the Kafka cluster. Right? So at this point, you're about two plus a teeny bit milliseconds between the producer writing and the consumer reading. Right? So we're just someone keep track, right? two milliseconds. Uh, now you want to send that through some type of complex event processing system, right? Maybe it's Storm, maybe it's Spark, if you're not worried about the micro-batching latency. Maybe you've just built your own, which a lot of folks do. You want to have that data go through all the different systems that are important to you, right? Maybe you have it go through the machine learning one, and then concurrently, right, you also want to have it go through some security validation, right? Now, back to the first one. Now when it's going through the machine learning uh, part of your system, you need to parallelize that potentially. You may actually need to take that message and break it into six different parts and run it on a bunch of different machines in order to get the data back in one time, right? To get to get to get like what what information you're trying to you know derive from it, and then concurrently at the same time you have this other system too that's trying to do a security check, right? So now here you've got two systems kind of happening. One is parallelized, and concurrently you have another one that's just doing a simple check. And then when they're both done, they kind of join back in at the end. And then, you know, it's four. I'm kind of following along here. Um, and that time is going to be whatever it takes for you to do whatever it is you want to do, right? If it takes you eight minutes to do a security validation, you've just added eight minutes to the processing. Get a new security system, right? <laughs> if, you're, if you're, right? So you're, you're, at this point, you're bottleneck for what processing you've done. And I see a lot of folks, they'll do processing within seven milliseconds, 15 milliseconds, and they're doing some really, uh, difficult things at very fast speeds with a lot of data. Um, so you can get to about, you know, what would be a total 7 to 15 milliseconds at the end of this piece, even just using something like Storm, right? If you take Storm and put this in there, even something like that system will still give you, you know, a, a, only another 10 milliseconds or so of, you know, what this processing looks like. And Storm's great for that just from the task parallelization perspective. Uh, but again, you could just <laughs> roll this your, yourself too. All right, so now that that's been completed, right, now you could have one single piece of code that looks at and says, hey, um, did the security check pass? Well, if it didn't, then your response is going to be different than if it did, right? Now, in either case, what happens at this point is you make an RPC call right back to the original producer that sent it. So imagine you have a bank of 1,000 machines and every machine is a producer for this discussion. And uh, the message came into the server 63. Well, that information of where the message originated, you bake that into either the key or the message of the data that you're writing to Kafka. And when the last part of the RPC system gets that data, it knows where to basically write back to and can do an RPC call right back into um, you know, the original producer. And you could do that in all sorts of different languages, in all sorts of different ways. Um, and then the producer gets that data, and it's holding a future or blocking or however it's been implemented. It gets the response, and then returns the response to the original sender. Right? And if you think about that, it's kind of cool. Like it, it, it's pure distributed RPC. Right? You've got a message come in. It now goes and runs on you know, dozens of different machines to basically calculate what that response should be. And then when the response is done, the information goes right back to the original, the originator, and uh, you know they've they've got their message back. So yeah, this can't work for high frequency trading, straight up, it can't. But 
for almost every other problem above that, you're going to be within a 25 millisecond window tops um, if you're really good at the you know, processing piece, obviously. Um, and with 25 milliseconds, that's, that's, that's really good. I mean, you can put that into a system with some network latency and still do uh, you know, quite a lot. Um, but of course, every use case is relative, so uh, something to be, to be thought through. Um, cool, any, any questions about kind of like distributed RPC or anything else in, in the distributed RPC side before we kind of talk about a different reference architecture? Yeah, so it depends. Uh, we've done it two different ways. So one way we've actually embedded it in the key. So when the producer writes the data to Kafka, it puts in the key. So when you write to Kafka, it's a tuple, it's a key, it's a key value, right? The value is the message. The key does a couple things. It tells you which partition it should be on, right? If you're doing compaction, it'll do some compaction stuff. But it's also a way to hold some metadata, right? And that key could actually be an object. It's binary data. So you could actually create a structure that you can kind of store this data inside the key. Or you could store it in the message, right? You know, flip a coin. Don't be too pedantic about it. The nice thing about being a key is, you know, if you're not using something like Avro, then you're not kind of muddled in with other messages of what people are reading and, like, you know, throw an exception or whatever like that. Um, but you just want to put that in there. It could just be a URL, nothing more. Right? It could be a REST endpoint that you have a persistent connection to. You could use Aqua remoting. I mean, there's all sorts of, to probably t have a talk for an hour just about all the different ways that you can do RPC at this point. You know, use Thrift, don't use Thrift, whatever it is, right? So you, as long as you know which machine you're connecting to, just sprinkle that in before you write it. You know, server 63, port 75, whatever it is, right? And then when you get the RPC call, you know exactly where to go and hit, and you send the data there. Cool. I don't know if I could repeat all that, but <laughs> it sounded, it's, uh, just to repeat it. So it sounds like in the spring integration, there's a connector that has a gateway that allows you to do this. Or kind of side. Okay. Cool. Mm-hmm. So the question is in number three, how does one consumer know to pull from that, right? Yeah, good question, good, good, good question. So the, the question is basically around one consumer versus multiple consumers and how is that read and how does that work, right? Yeah, so the whole idea here is that this would be one consumer group Right? You, can't have, you can have other people reading from the stream at the same time. The complexity then becomes a lot more difficult to have it join back in later. Right? It's better to kind of just have one consumer group reading all the data in, and then within whatever type of you know, direct exilic graph system that you're using, let it handle that kind of stream coordination. If you had another system that was reading this, uh, you're going to start sending stuff back to the producer at the same time. Now you have to bake the logic into the producer to go and coordinate. It's like, oh, I got this response. I got that response. And like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do with that? Right? You want to keep all of that complexity like, in four, essentially. Right? So you have all the data coming into this one you know, architectural part of the system and the subsystems within it. Because when all of that is done, it goes to that one kind of RPC endpoint. Right? If you were, and not to <laughs> keep bringing up Storm, but like, I'm not doing that to promote it, just a good example, like you could have a bolt so that it, it, it waits for all the pieces of messages that has to come in, right? Like so, so many systems have been built to do that and you want to let them do that for you. Um, and then once it's done, it just, it goes ahead and pushes back in. Now, while that's running, there's nothing stopping, uh, you know, other consumers reading at the same time, essentially, uh, to do other things. And there may be some situations where you might have to have multiple consumers reading and then you know, aggregating some result uh, and then, you know, pushing it back. But that, that would be, a, I think, a, a little unnecessarily complex. But so I'm not sure if that completely answers your question or not a little bit. 
Any other questions before we kind of switch over the reference architecture? And we should still have like five, 10 minutes for questions uh, afterwards. All right, cool. All right, so yeah, so this is like a reference architecture we use, I, I use pretty often with folks. Uh, kind of the idea here is like we've got lots of data in lots of different systems and ultimately what we want to do is store, analyze, and search this data. Yay, awesome, cool. So at step one, right, the idea here is that you want to do a little transformation up front at the producer side as possible. Uh, this is not just a technical thing, this is also politics and religion within organizations, right? You've got different groups responsible for different pieces of data. You should just get them to get the data in Kafka. Don't worry about what the format is, what transformations have to happen. Don't worry about any of that, right? Quick, simple, like you have an AS400, no problem. Just get the data into Kafka. Don't worry about the form, nothing. Binary data. Producer, into Kafka. After that, you worry about everything else that we just talked about. You worry about your transformations, right? How do I take this XML data and turn it into a protocol buffer, right? How do I turn this you know, JSON data into some proprietary format that we've been using for years that nobody knows about, right? All of that should be handled within your transformation tier, which is two, three. And there's lots of different systems that have been built that could allow you to do this, um, that work with Kafka just from a streaming perspective, or you could just write your own, right? Just write your own consumers that read the data, make whatever transformation it needs to make, and then produce it back into Kafka. Um, and that's kind of where this you know, topic S comes in, right? The quote unquote standard topic, right? You've kind of like normalized your data set now, right? Maybe you have 750 different XML versions that you have to support, but you don't wanna to have to do an analysis on every single different version, right? You wanna create a normalization of your entire uh, uh, data set, right? And this allows you to do that, so when you're doing your analysis, um, you're doing it on basically one structure, you know, potentially Avro. Uh, so now at five and seven, we're kind of lambda architecturing here a little bit. So you know, in five, we're taking the data and basically, you know, raw, just no no calculations, no nothing. Uh, you just write the data somewhere, whether it's uh, Cassandra or Hadoop or you know wherever you're storing your data. Um, just write it, no transformation, stream write, and then. Uh, in 7.8, here's where you have a system that's actually maybe trying to do some calculations, right? Maybe it's reading the data that's coming in and it's trying to do some real-time analysis, right? If this was log and metric data, you could have some machine learning trying to figure out and predict whether or not there's gonna be an outage based on the traffic and the metrics and the spikes and the logs and the exceptions and everything else, right? So you really have the ability here at the 7 and 8 streaming box to really kind of do all the analysis that you wanna do. And when you do that, one, write it back to Kafka, right? It's like, I can't say this enough. Every single time you write somewhere, make sure it's in Kafka too, because once it's in Kafka, then somebody else can read that analysis instantly, right? So you could have a consumer, if you want to use something like Redis, you can use a consumer that you know, consumes the data from this you know, topic that has all this analyzed data, push it into the Redis cache, let Redis do its pub sub, and then have all the you know, WebSocket end users basically have a UI that's completely you know, changing in real time within you know, less than a second from one, right? All the way through to 11, you're like under a second, right? And you can see in real time, whatever calculations are happening, whether it's number of users or latency, whatever you're calculating, whatever you're analyzing. Um, and then you wanna put that in your data store too, obviously, right? Because you wanna go and run different batch analytics, you wanna do reporting, right? You want your data store to basically have that um, uh, information as well. So it's important to kind of, I think, understand the difference between where the Kafka broker plays from the distributed replicated log perspective and then where data warehouses uh, play. And to me, data warehouse is really Hadoop or Cassandra, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, and then at that point, right, it's in, you know, now if you rewind to the beginning of the talk, like, yay, our data's in Hadoop. Let me use Impala to do an SQL ANSI 92 compliant uh, query. No probs. Right? Or, oh, it's in Cassandra, cool, let me do a solar search against that. Right? You just pop in DSE and like, boom, all the data in Cassandra is indexed in solar and you can go and you know, grep. Right? So like, if you use Splunk and you don't want to use Splunk anymore, implement an architecture like this. Put all your data in Kafka, have all the log data in Kafka, you know, run it into Cassandra, use DSE, and then boom. Now all of a sudden all your log data is now searchable in solar. Right? And this is, uh, is this, this is becoming much easier stuff, right? I mean, in the grand scheme of things, it's hard, but from a software engineering perspective and the stuff that we do every day, it's gotten way easier, right? I mean, this is the kind of stuff that everybody is doing now, uh, which is awesome. 
All right, um, so that's kind of all I had. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any questions. You know, I guess hit me up for the next nine minutes or until I get kicked off stage. Uh, and then I'll be around for a little bit after if you want to talk. Uh, you know, that, that's cool too. Thanks. All right, so question. Yeah, yeah. Welcome. yeah, cool. So the question was uh, different mirror maker implementations and uh, being able to mirror to a different topic. Yeah, so there's a lot of different cruft in the Apache Project Mirror Maker, right? It's, it's a good system for doing the one thing that it was built for. As you start to try to have it do different things, it's very difficult. Uh, we actually wrote an open source to Mirror Maker. So if you go to github.com slash stealthly, S-T-E-A-L-T-H-L-Y slash go underscore Kafka underscore client, or just go to Google and just type in, you know, go Kafka mirror maker, or just ask me later, whatever, anyway. So like, yeah, you can use that mirror maker, and that mirror maker has all sorts of like bells and whistles to, you can prefix the topic, right? So let's say you have three data centers, you know, data center A, data center B, and data center C is your aggregate. Right? You don't have to have the topic names be different, so when it mirrors up to the aggregate, you've got two topics. Right? Like, how do you negotiate that? Right? I have my Apple topic and my Apple topic, and now I'm trying to push it into the same. Maybe you want to have DC apples, and, D, right? and you want to separate that from a topic perspective. You know, if you use something like Avro, you really actually don't have to do that technically. Right? You can put that metadata information inside of the message. However, that's not always the best way to do it. And yes, sometimes you actually want to use topics to organize that, and we do that all the time, every day, six ways from Sunday, continuously. And that's why we actually wrote like, a new mirror maker. Like, it wasn't just about, oh yeah, let's just write this and go. It was more about, like, we actually need this mirror maker to do stuff that we can't do uh, with the Apache project. So, yeah. I don't know if, I actually don't know of any other mirror makers besides ours and the Apache project one. <laughs> yeah, just type in go, like G-O, Kafka, Mirror Maker. Should come up. If not, then catch me after. Question? Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so the question is, for a company who's starting out that doesn't have RabbitMQ or Kafka, but maybe has you know, something like IBM uh, you know, MQ series or something else, what's the recommendation? Um, really, the recommendation is, I would say, look at all the use cases that you're using the queuing system for and see if there's anything that Kafka can't do, essentially. Uh, you know, there's no, there's, right now, there's no out-of-the-box transactions. right? There's no you know, item potence. So if you are looking for your queue to do things like item potence or transactions, you're going to have to build a lot of software to be able to do that. And whether or not that's worth it is a business decision. Right? Do we spend the engineering resources to do this or not? And I've seen some people keep parts of their queuing systems right, just because of things like that. And I've seen other people just you know, say, we're completely getting rid of this, and we'll just take the R&D hit, and we'll just go build this one component that's not there, we'll just go build around it, right? It's not that big of a deal to you know, build whatever was missing. Um, and a lot of folks have done that, right? They've either had proprietary queuing systems or you know, using some other large organization's queuing system. And you know, the reasons that you do it is like, it's, it's not only that it's just open source, right? It's also that you have a huge community of people using it and it scales to you know, like, like really no other system. It's kind of cool. Uh, I don't, I, it's hard for me to say like what use cases you could have, but like, you know what? Honestly, there's use cases. If you're, you know, you don't want to implement JVM, can't use Kafka, right? You got to use Rabbit. Uh, you know, what happens if there's a problem and you have to go fix it? Do you have any Erlang developers? If not, you might as well get a proprietary system, right? <laughs> but if you've got Scala and Java developers, there's a whole lot more of those in a big community around it. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that you have to kind of weigh, and to me, that's not just a rabbit Kafka thing. That's just a more of a, how do I know which open source project to use, right? Um, you know, who are the community behind it? How many different organizations are actually working in it? Now, Kafka, over the last couple years, you know, went from, you know, like when I started with the project, it was like the LinkedIn people and me, 
And like, it grew. And it's cool because now you've got thousands of different companies you know, using it and hundreds of people contributing to it, right? Like literally hundreds of people contribute to it. And it's, it's everyone, right? It's a uh, it's, 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 it's different answer over, over time. So again, it's hard to say which one to choose without specifics, um, but most likely I would end up saying Kafka, right? So yeah. Yeah, so the question is, uh, yeah, yeah, PH, yep, yep, yep. So the question is, uh, how do you do this in non-JVM languages? There. So the client page has every, there's, there are so many clients. There's actually three JavaScript clients, right? So there's, there's not enough room on this slide to even come close to putting all the different clients out there. There's a PHP one, there's a C one. So if you don't like the PHP one, the C one is awesome. The librd Kafka one is fantastic. Write a module, expose it, you know? Oh, no, 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 sorry, I meant from, I was saying, like, I was thinking purely from the broker perspective. Okay. Like, let's say you had a requirement where you're at, you know, you, you were, JVM MVP. exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, Not that I'm aware of, honestly. The question is, can the, the new is there anything the new consumer can do that the old simple consumer cannot? Other, Other way around, right, yeah. Is there, yeah. I, not, not currently, not that I know of. Question, yep. Go for it. Yep, yep. I understand your question now. Yeah, yeah, I get your question. Yeah, 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 I got it, I got it, I got it, okay. okay. Now you understand. All right, so the question is, um, how long does Kafka keep the data for? Right? All right, so there's two, yeah, yeah, where are the implications, because it's a stream and it's just running and like, oh my God, what happens? Yep, all right, so there are three different ways that Kafka will delete data, okay? One is based on time, right? So you can set and just say, all right, after four days, don't care, right, prune. You can say, after 20 gigabytes, don't care, prune, right? Or you can use what's called compaction. Um, and there's an out-of-the-box compaction. It's not hard to write your own, I mean, none of this is easy, but like, you can go in and write your own compaction as well. Um, you'd have to change the source code, but you know, people do this, right? It's open source. Uh, what compaction does is it basically, the out-of-the-box compaction, what it does is it looks at all the keys and basically gets rid of any messages that are older that have the same key. Right? So if you're doing things like event sourcing or you have some system where you only want to have the latest version, compaction is for you. Right? So there's a couple of different ways to handle that. Now, can Kafka store data forever? Sure. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good idea. Right? Like, I usually recommend people to re rethink why they're trying to do that and assess what solutions are, you know, are there for them. Uh, you know, Kafka is a streaming server. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, and it's and it, and if you, yeah, if you want to go back a year, you're better off. You're better off taking the data wherever it's stored, loading it back into Kafka, and sh having the stream just sitting on that topic. A lot of people do that, right? Whether you pull it off of S3, it's. I mean, we're talking about money at this point, right? It's like, you know, I've got 48 terabytes of like EBS versus something. I mean, it's not whether it's AWS or whatever. It's not like you're talking about you know different economics, right? And and when you're at that scale. It's it's hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? So, and you have you have to think that way, right? Yeah, 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 right. It's important. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is how best to use Kafka and AWS and how to deal and negotiate with things like the auto-scaling groups and if a broker dies, how does it come back and all of that. Yeah, uh, run all of that on Mesos. So install Mesos and AWS and then run, uh, I'll give you a link. <laughs> I would talk after too. 
Um, where is it? There. Yeah, so go to github.com slash mesos slash Kafka, and then this will basically let you run Kafka on Mesos. So once your Mesos cluster is deployed to AWS, then at that point, uh, your auto-scaling is just the Mesos agents, the servers themselves. Um, all the fault tolerances and running and starting and stopping and everything else, that's completely automated inside the software. Yeah, 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 so that's even cooler. That's a whole separate talk. Come to Cassandra Summit next week, and I'm actually talking about that at Cassandra Summit next week uh, with Docker and Mesos and all this stuff. But like, yeah, I mean, you actually could build very intelligent orchestrated microservices where you're building schedulers that are running and understand. I actually gave a talk about this at MesosCon too, if you want to check out the video or we can talk after. Uh, you could actually build software that actually can orchestrate all the different microservices that are running. And those are both producers and consumers, right? And you build software, uh, and I won't turn this into a Mesos talk, but yeah, you, you do that. Um, any other questions? Or getting kicked off stage? Getting kicked off stage. Here comes the. <laughs> all right, thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.